Good morning. I too would like to welcome you to Northside Community Church Zoom service. Uh, glad that each each of you have joined us today. Um, it's uh, we've been operating under the name Northside Community Church for a few months now, um, but yesterday, thanks to Nick Barrett and uh, um, Brad Hauser, the new sign was put in place. So I mean, it's the, the new signage. It's the same old sign, but new uh, new graphics, etc. So if you get a chance to drive by the church, drive by and take a look at that. There's still a little more work to do on it in terms of the lighting, but. Thank you, Nick, for spearheading that, and Brad, for your help in that as well. It looks great. So welcome to Northside Community Church. Um, it's funny because even in our community contacts, most a lot of them already know us as Northside Community Church. Now we finally have a sign that says it, so that's good. Uh, next Sunday, at the end of the service, we like as today, there will be a sharing time. And uh, as I mentioned, I know Dave Milton already has a prayer request, and others of you may have prayer or praise things or comments in regards to what you hear. Um, next week, we're going to do a thing. We're going to call it Zoom Rooms. Uh, this will be a one-off. And those of you that want to, just you can stay on. And then you'll be placed into rooms where you will be able to talk to uh, a smaller group of people rather than 70 screens trying to talk to and share. We'll be putting people into smaller rooms. And that's completely optional. It's kind of like uh, Terry Wong is heading this up. It's like when we would meet in person and we do, did the guest who's coming to lunch and, and you'd be assigned, you were either a host or you were a guest at somebody's house and you didn't know who. Uh, it's it's going to kind of be like that. It's just a chance for people to interact in a little more meaningful way. I mean, it's great that we can see each other on Zoom, but obviously has some limitations. So we're going to try this the one time and see just how that works for us. Um, yeah, I think that's all I really have for announcements. If I'm missing anything, somebody can uh, pipe up at the end. So we started this new series, When Heaven Breaks In, and it's looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever preached. And today we're going to, we did an introduction last week. Today we're going to look at the Beatitudes. So I'm going to read it, and uh, the first 12 verses of chapter 5, I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Hope you'll follow along or pull out your device or uh, Bible and follow along. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Uh, let's, let's pray. Father God, as we come to you today and as we come to your word, uh, we know that you guided and inspired Matthew as he recorded this account of your son teaching us what it means to be blessed. We thank you that your spirit indwells us and it permeates our gathering together today. That in the same way that you inspired Matthew, you will not only just enlighten us, but that you might transform us that we might be live in alliance in alignment with your kingdom and the things that you value, the things that are important to you. So just guide us now as we open your word, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So let me start with a question. 
what is, and I, I think this is the question that Jesus is answering in this sermon, what is the good life? What does it mean to be blessed? I think from a human perspective, we, we could all rattle off all kinds of things. And I started writing some down and I could go on and on and on, but I, I won't do that. But it, some of them, maybe we think about financial success. If we have financial success, that's the good life. That means we've been blessed. Or maybe it's a nice house or a nice car. Or if you watch advertising, it's perfect hair. Maybe it's no wrinkles. You watch these ads now where you can get rid of all your wrinkles and the, and the, and the saggy, saggy spots under places under your eyes. You young people don't have that problem. Maybe it's being fit, maybe being pretty, being popular, being having good health, having friends, not having anxiety. That would be that's a good life. Being smart, maybe the freedom to travel the world. Eating good food, being able to dine out, maybe having the latest and greatest computer, phone, or gadgets. Maybe that's the good life. You know, and we all see the advertising on TV and we see it now on uh, social media, the ads that come up, and they're appealing to us to buy th things to live a good life. We watch celebrities, we watch athletes, we, we see musicians, we watch royalty, and maybe we watch them with envy, thinking that they have it all, that they have the good life. You know, this is, this is award seasons, award show season. And even tonight, I think, is the Academy Awards. And even though it's virtual, they'll be on the red carpet with their designer gowns and suits and tuxedos, etc., in their own homes. And, and we, we watch this. Maybe we think that's what it's all about. It's kind of funny that even in this weekend, yesterday morning, we had a, there was a funeral for a royalty and tonight is an award show for actors. But I wonder, sometimes in the church, I wonder if we, we also come up with our own definition of the good life. Maybe it's the, the idea of being viewed as being spiritual. Maybe it's, you know, that you're an elder or you're a deacon or a pastor and so maybe you're, you think you're seen as being better than most. Is that the good spiritual life? And I think what the good life is differs from person to person. Depends on what you value, what's important to you. So how would you define the good life? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to be blessed? And we pursue things. And, and we teach our kids to pursue these things. We want our kids to get good grades in school because we want them to go to a good college or a good university. We want them to get a good job that pays well. We want them to marry well. We want them to buy a house, maybe see them travel. So let's, let's turn, turn that over a little bit. What would we see as not being the good life? Being poor, being hungry, ugly, Weak, oppressed, alone, in some cases beaten or tortured, being uneducated, being victimized, being plagued by illness or having poor health conditions. Is that like a, is that a bad life? Is that the opposite of the good life? Today we come to the Beatitudes and sometimes it's the B attitudes. It's a little cheesy, but it works. Um, you know, and when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount, when it comes to the Beatitudes, there is so much material available. I mean, I listened to some teaching. I read commentaries. I listened to sermons, you know, in my preparation. And there's so much more that I could study and read. And we are going to do, the, there were some people, I, I saw Daryl Johnson's series, and he did eight eight sermons on the Beatitudes while well, we're doing one on just the Beatitudes. I don't want us to get completely tired of um, this series because I think there's a lot for us to learn here. The word bless is a difficult word to translate. It's a difficult word for us to understand and we, we will put our own ideas into it. In Greek and Roman thought, they had a couple of ideas. One was the blissful existence of the gods. 
And the second thought was the highest type of well-being possible for human beings. So maybe where that's where we get this human idea of the good life. It's the, the highest type of well-being po possible for human beings. But what, what do we pour into that? For the Jews to be blessed meant that you were a beneficiary of the favor of God. And, and that's not hard to understand. You know, the idea is that, that if you obeyed the rules, God would bless you. If you were disobedient, uh, bad things would happen to you. And that's not hard to grasp when you look at the blessings and the cursings in Deuteronomy, when you look at the book of Job and what Job's friends are suggesting to him, that the reason that he has all these ailments and, and this loss was because he must have sinned. You read Proverbs and, and you, you get that idea. If you trust God and you believe in him, that he, all things will go well with you in this poetical literature. And I think as Christians, we sometimes fall into that kind of mindset, almost like a, a Christian karma mindset that we create. And we wonder, well, I've been good. Why is this happening to me? I've heard people say that. You know, and in Jesus' day, there were the Pharisees. Now, these guys were extremely zealous for being obedient to God, for following God, zealous for the law. Uh, they were considered the most spiritual ones in that culture they were respected they were educated they were successful in terms of the jewish life they were living the good life but they weren't blessed jesus comes along <clears throat> but he doesn't hang out oh my my chair just went crazy on me there we go jesus comes along he doesn't hang out with with the spiritual people the good people he hangs out with the sinners. And he taught differently than the scholars of his day. So that ordinary people could understand his teaching. We looked at that, we did look at some of the parables, parables recently. And through stories or the questions that he would ask, uh, or in this greatest of sermons that he preaches, he teaches to correct prevailing assumptions and practices that were wrong. Um, you know, they had certain ideas of, of what should happen in, in a particular situation or what the truth was. You take uh, the rich young ruler comes to him and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, you know, what does the law say? And he said, well, I, I, I keep the law. And, and he had this prevailing assumption that if I kept the law, I would go to heaven. I would please God. And Jesus tells him, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, then follow me because he had a prevailing assumption that was incorrect and Jesus corrects that prevailing assumption. Same with the other one who comes and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan because there were, he had a prevailing assumption that Samaritans were evil and horrible and everything else. And Jesus just cuts through that and corrects that prevailing assumption with truth. You know, when, when Jesus heals a lame man from birth and his disciples ask, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus cuts through again that prevailing assumption that if something bad happened to you, you must have done something wrong. That Christian karma idea. So, you know, if you have that prevailing assumption, you need to correct that. And this is what he does throughout the Sermon on the Mount. And today he's going to correct our thinking as to what it means to be blessed, what the good life really is. As I mentioned, blessed is a difficult word to translate. Some translations uh, use the, the term happy. But the term happy is more about our orientation, it, you know, that we are happy. Uh, this word blessed is really more God-oriented, not human-oriented. So it's not really whether we're happy, but is God pleased? Is God happy? Other words that are used are fortunate, approved, good on you, right? Good on you if you're merciful. Uh, God smiles on you right on. The idea is that the kingdom is working in you or that you are in alignment with the kingdom. You are in sync with God's kingdom. That's what it means to be blessed. Uh, Pennington, uh, a newer scholar, 
refers to it being human flourishing. In other words, that we are actually living the way that we were designed to live. And so we are living life to the full. So even that Greek idea of, of living to the fullest, there's truth. But the idea really is that living in alignment with God's kingdom, the way we were designed to live, to be truly human and living in sync with the kingdom. Uh, Zadiades is a, is a Greek scholar, uh, does word studies, and he says, blessed means to be characterized by the quality of God. When one is indwelt by God and God's nature is in that one, one has the kingdom of God within oneself. It also means to be fully satisfied. This satisfaction, however, is not due to the circumstances of the life, nor the fulfillment of the conditions prescribed in these beatitudes, but due to Christ's indwelling. Blessedness is that basic condition created by Christ's indwelling in man's heart, which brings a fundamental satisfaction in the life of the believer. Christ's indwelling in man's heart, which brings a fundamental satisfaction in the life of the believer. John Piper says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So it's finding our satisfaction in God and being in his kingdom as opposed to our circumstances. So Jesus is going to correct the prevailing assumption of the first century in this, in when he preaches this sermon, of what it meant to be blessed, what it meant to live in sync with the kingdom. Now back to the Pharisees again. They had their ideas. They had their rules as to what the kingdom was about. And they told, let everybody know, you have to do this, you have to do this, tithe on your herbs, et cetera, et cetera. Really extreme. And they were really good at trying to live out based on their assumptions but then jesus brings these new ideas about what it means to live in sync with his kingdom jesus describes what it means to see his kingdom come his will be done on earth as it is in heaven what it looks like when heaven breaks in on earth really it's the future invading the present so these are not attributes or qualities that we try to work on so I'm going to lay out a few assumptions here, and then we'll get into the meanings of these. Uh, these are spiritual qualities that the Holy Spirit works into our lives when we become a follower of Jesus. And it is a progressive work. It's something that is ongoing, that we continue to learn and grow in. It's the working out of our salvation, in a sense. So I said these are not natural human qualities, but are spiritual that result from being a part of God's kingdom. These qualities, when you read the, the text, are bookended by the phrase, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You'll see that in verse 3, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he, had, he, he bookends it with theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And, and the structure of that means that that phrase, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, applies to all of the Beatitudes. You could read any one of them, right? And you could say, blessed are those who mourn, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, that phrase, now the word for can also be translated because. And so just think about how that changes things. Blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn because they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, because they shall inherit the earth. And the term theirs is the kingdom literally means they and they only. Theirs and theirs only. These are the, so these are attributes are only true of those who are part of God's kingdom. Now you may know somebody who would be merciful but that does not mean that they are blessed in the sense that this that Jesus is using here and that they are in his kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they and they only, for theirs and theirs only is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they and they only shall be comforted. So you get that idea? So you can read reread them at your own time with that understanding. 
So let's take a walk through these qualities. Like I said, you th we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks just on the Beatitudes, but we're just going to look, and I'm only really going to look at the, the, the qualities, the poor in spirit, uh, the merciful, the meek. I'm not going to get into the, the consequence part of it at all, actually. Um, there is so much out there that if you want to study that further, uh, you can do that. Just go to YouTube and put in Sermon on the Mount sermons and you'll get lots. So let's take a look at these qualities, the poor in spirit. Now, when you think about being poor, think about it financially. To be poor financially means that you have no, no or very little money. You're, you could be destitute or bankrupt. And in the Greek language, there are a couple of words that can be translated poor. One means um, poor, but able to help oneself. That is not the word that is used here. The word that is used here means poor, but unable to help oneself, having to ask for help. So the idea here is being spiritually destitute, bankrupt, unable to help oneself. It means being empty-handed and having to ask for help. And God gives it. Unless you come to God empty, you will not be a part of his kingdom. If you think that you have something to offer God, you know he's chuckling a little bit. But this is, we see this throughout the New Testament. It's the paradox of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and, and one scholar talks about that Jesus isn't being turning this upside down. He's actually turning things right side up. Our world is upside down. And he's turning it right side up. When you think about it, he, he tells us, in order to have life, you need to die to yourself. In order to receive, you need to give, right? You give and receive. So God's kingdom and his economy is completely different than the, the economy of this world. And he's saying to, be, to have the kingdom of heaven, for it to be yours, you need to come in, in spiritual bankruptcy and cry out to God for help. I've told this story before about visiting a church that my sister used to be involved with up in, up in Kelowna. And it was a church for the homeless, for the impoverished, for um, the addicted, for the disenfranchised. And we went the one Sunday and we're told about um, somebody who was affiliated with the church, who was a drug addict, who had overdosed and had died. And they have open mic sharing every Sunday and the, her friend shared about her going, you know, you maybe judged her because she was a drug addict and, and prostituted herself in order to meet her habit. But you didn't know that she had been gang raped and, and that she, you didn't see her lie on my living room floor crying out to God for mercy. When was the last time I did that? When was the last time you did that? That's what it means to be poor in spirit, coming to God empty-handed and crying out to him. Next one is those who mourn. And again, in the Greek language, there are se several words for the word to translate mourning. This is the strongest of those words. It's that complete and utter anguish. And here, it's not... You know, and, and in our world, we have different kinds of mourning. I, I felt like uh, in this season, I've been grieving some in terms of loss through this season of COVID. Maybe some of you have felt that same way. Um, some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you have lost financially and jobs and have lost um, your health. And, and, and we do have these different kinds of loss and these different kinds of mourning. The mourning that he is talking about here is sorrow for one's sin. So when you come to God empty-handed and you come with your sinfulness and you have this sorrow for your sin and for the sin of the world, sin in the world, and it, and it makes you grieve. Do you grieve over the sin in the world? Or because you go to church, do we think we're better? These people see things for the way they really are. And this world is so broken, such a mess. 
those who mourn, mourn over sin. Next is the gentle, also translated meek in my English standard. Some translations use humble. In the Bible, there are three people who are described as being meek. Moses, Paul, and Jesus. And sometimes we think meek is weak, but it's not weak. It is actually a great strength. The meek don't react out of their hurt or wounded pride. They don't need to get even. I remember hearing the definition one time of humble being a willingness to leave the scales unbalanced. Taking the hit, right? They have learned to trust God in any situation. Zadiadi says to become angry at sin. It is the active attitude of the Christian towards sin in combating it instead of a passive indifferent attitude. Hunger, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you can see some, some scholars see these as being progressive in, as in stepping stones. Uh, I'll leave that to you to, to wrestle with and figure out. Those who hunger, those who are famished, who are starved for righteousness. Those who thirst, who are, whose soul is dry and they want righteousness to quench that thirst. Uh, Daryl Johnson says this, that it, the word righteousness really means to be right related. And that we are called into a fourfold uh, right relatedness. First of all, to be rightly related to God. To be rightly related to others. And that's believers and unbelievers. To be rightly related to oneself, right? Being self-aware, being seeing yourself as God sees you and rightly related to creation. And I think it's interesting just having gone through our sermon, our vision sermon series, uh, that that's what our vision is about. Community with God, being rightly related to God. Community with one another, being rightly related to one another within the church. Community for the world, to be rightly related to the world, to those in the world around us. Sounds familiar, right? Hungering and thirsting for righteousness, that rightly relatedness to, we desire to be rightly related to God, others, ourselves, and creation. Then the merciful. So I'm driving over the Alex Fraser Bridge the other day, and surprisingly enough, I'm, I'm doing pretty good when it comes to the speed limit there, which is now 70 kilometers. But as I'm doing 70 kilometers, okay, maybe 75, um, this, this car is whizzing by me, right? And what goes through my head? You hope there's a cop on the other side because you want them to get justice, right? I'm not showing mercy. I want justice. Justice is getting what you deserve, and I wanted these drivers to get what they deserved. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. And those all tie together. We have, in his mercy, Jesus took our justice on himself. And then that we experience his grace where we don't get what we deserve. Uh, Daryl Johnson says this is empathizing with unbelievers. Suffering with them in the consequences of their sin and doing everything possible to relieve the tragic result. So when you have that neighbor that irritates you, do you demonstrate mercy or do you want them to get justice? What's the attitude in your heart and mind? Is it in sync with the kingdom of heaven or is it in sync with the world? You know, think about if, if there was no retaliations in this world, and, and I don't know that that, would, that wouldn't work either. We know that people would be exploited, etc. anyway. But think about the escalations that go on in this world, the retaliations, uh, the wars that are a result of wrong human attitudes, be it, be it race, be it economic, be it ethn ethnicity, whatever. Selfishness. We need to be merciful people for 
ours and ours only is the kingdom of heaven. The pure in heart, this means to be unmixed, unalloyed, unadulterated at the very center of your being. It's your core, your heart is your core. And to be completely unmixed there, the pure in heart. It's like taking gold and purifying it. So it's just pure gold, removing all the, all the dross and all the impurities, right? It, it, gets, it has to go through heat to do that, but it purifies it. And we are to have that unmixed, unadulterated heart. And that is a, a continuous thing as well, right? Uh, he promises, God promises that if, if we sin, if we, we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this pure in heart is also an ongoing thing, it's something that we are always growing in. Uh, none of us are there yet, but we are all works in progress. The peacemakers needs to be fully orbed, fully rounded out peace in our lives. It's not just the stopping of feuding between nations or people. It's the bringing of God's peace that, the, that we have experienced, that we have been reconciled to God and we have that peace with God. We are rightly related to God and to bring that to the rest of humanity. You know, as, as a nation, Canada kind of prides itself in being peacekeepers, but these are peacemakers, bringing peace. And you think back, in order to, to be a peacemaker, you need to be meek. You need to be humble. The arrogant don't make good peacemakers. The humble do. The merciful do. Pure in heart do. Right? Those who mourn. Those who understand, those who are, those are those who can be peacemakers. And then there are those who have been persecuted. For theirs and theirs only is the kingdom of heaven. And not, and the key is that they are persecuted for righteousness. If persecuted, you're not being persecuted because you're a jerk. That's on you. That's not what characterizes people of Jesus' kingdom. And we're not talking about being happy again. We're talking about being blessed because you're in sync with God's kingdom. When you live in sync with God's kingdom, one of two things is going to happen. There are those who are not of the kingdom or who are even anti-kingdom who are going to push back against you and you will experience persecution. Or as, as Jesus preface this sermon his, his, his whole ministry the gospel is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand they will either push back or they will repent and, and experience the joy of the kingdom right He's, he tells you rejoice for yours is the king is the kingdom you are in good company as we read in verses in verses 11 and 12 blessed are you and others revive you he, he describes more of what you might experience you persecutes you, utter all kinds of evil and utter and against you falsely on my account, on account of me. Blessed are you on account of me. You're not blessed because you're doing the right things or, or, or whatever. You're blessed because you are a part of God's kingdom and his kingdom attributes are being worked into your life. It all begins and ends with Jesus, not with us. And it's about living in sync with him. So let me go back, close with where I started. What is the good life? It is living one's life in sync with Jesus and allowing his life, his attributes to become who you are. So are you living the good life. Let me pray. Father God, we, we so need you to work these qualities into our life. We know that we cannot do it on our own. If we do it on our own. We will fail. We will feel guilty. We will become self-righteous even, possibly. But we come to you poor in spirit, meek, mourning our sin, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, 
seeking to bring your peace to this world, knowing that it may result in persecution and hardship. But you tell us that in those circumstances, in, in that, that way, we are blessed. So we pray that we would seek the good life, a life in sync with your kingdom and life in sync with your son. And we ask that you do this by your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
is where they 